Good afternoon and welcome to the Asia Pacific College of Diplomacy. Uh, today we're talking to uh, Fergus Hansen who is an expert on e-diplomacy. Fergus has been visiting the ANU today to talk to our Masters of Diplomacy students who are uh, having a series of diplomatic practitioner seminars. Uh, and Fergus is the Director of Innovation at Walk Free, an NGO committed to ending slavery, modern day slavery. Uh, he's also a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution um, and is uh, previously has worked at the Lowy Institute in Sydney and also at the Department of Foreign Affairs in Canberra. We're going to start off with asking Fergus a little bit uh, basically to describe e-diplomacy and the practice of e-diplomacy, but particularly to talk about his recent research on the US State Department and the use of e-diplomacy. So Fergus, tell us about your most recent paper. Well, the paper um, Baked In and Wide basically builds on a, a mapping exercise I did looking at the extent of e-diplomacy at state and it focuses in on the three areas where e-diplomacy is used the most so that is knowledge management, uh, the internal, uh, the use of technology to exchange information internally within the department, uh, public diplomacy so how the State Department communicates using social media and other electronic tools uh, with the rest of the world and also internet freedom the way it is countering efforts by other states to try and monitor and uh, filter the and censor the internet and prevent people uh, from accessing uh, whatever they want to access online. And tell us a little bit about the internet freedom part of it because that might be a point of difference for the way Australia uses the internet for example. Well, this is a, probably the really uh, pointy end of e-diplomacy and since 2008 the US Congress has allocated $100 million towards efforts to uh, counter um, the censorship and filtering of the internet by other countries. Um, so for example if you're in China it's very difficult to access uh, Facebook or Gmail for example and so the developed tools uh, not just countering China but all countries that filter the internet are tools that individuals and activists can use to communicate with each other without being observed by government officials or security forces and that they can keep on communicating if uh, the government tries to shut down uh, the internet. So uh, they've developed tools like the Internet in a Suitcase, which is a mobile version of, of the internet that can be carried into situations where there's a, the government might be shutting down the internet, as happened in Libya and Egypt, for example. Uh, they're developing tools to protect al activists if they're uh, arrested so they can race the contents of their mobile phones. And they're working online to try and uh, uh, counter uh, messages that, um, well, I promote these tools and, and also train activists uh, in, in awareness and how to be safe online as well. And I've heard Hillary Clinton talk about the freedom to connect, which is kind of a 21st century idea, a new human rights idea, but it is, it is controversial, isn't it? It's basically right on the edge of what's allowable under international law and, and diplomatic practice with respect and sovereignty. Yeah, it's a really unusual aspect of diplomacy because traditionally there's this uh, notion that you shouldn't interfere in the internal affairs of a, of a state. But I think that what the State Department has done is really taken this issue and put it as a, a badged it as a human rights issue in a way. And in that sense, it's an overarching issue. So it, it supersedes uh, domestic political issues and it's something that really covers the, the sort of global issue, the right to, to free speech and the right to access information. And I think that that, that notion is so appealing uh, to people around the world that it's very hard for a lot of governments to really push back against that. Um, it's so hard to argue against the free flow of information or, or the right to communicate with your friends or your family online. It is very much linked to the huge internet-based companies being American companies though. Like, do you think it's, I mean, it's twinned with that national interest, you would think? I think that there is an extent that you know, obviously the United States is home to you know, the internet and Silicon Valley and a, a huge number of companies that make a fortune uh, through, through the internet. But I, I think that this really fits more closely with its, its um, human rights aspect of its uh, foreign policy rather than so much uh, pushing its products. Of course it's a, it's a handy byproduct when if, or the whole world wants to communicate on Facebook and Twitter. You know, that's fantastic for US business. Um, but I think it, it does run deeper than just a, a commercial interest. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's my impression at least. So Australia just needs to create the next Twitter. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll get on that. Now, uh, I'm interested in is is there any lessons from the US State Department and their use of uh, e diplomacy in any of those fields? Maybe not the internet freedom one so much, but the the other two, knowledge management and public diplomacy, that would help the Asia Pacific region and maybe the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Well, I think one of the um, the issues that have been has been under um, done in, in the Pacific in particular is mobile phones mm. and we've only just recently seen the mobile phone market open up in the Pacific through the entry of Digicel. Digicel There's yeah. much more work to be done there and there's almost a, uh, when you look at Africa for example and parts of um, uh, Asia as well, the potential uh, use of those tools in a whole range of, of everyday circumstances is enormous from mobile banking in particular I think has enormous potential in the Pacific and also communication on a whole range of fronts from basic sort of market conditions and, and basic information that people need as well as just communicating with each other or transferring money uh, around the place it's uh, it's a really can be a really helpful uh, tool. But what about for the practice of diplomacy from DFAT's point of view is there is there things we can learn from the State Department? I think there's a lot we can learn. Um, one of the things that has fundamentally sort of shifted um, as a result of these tools is the way that governments uh, are now starting to communicate with much larger audiences. So diplomats in the past used to communicate with maybe if they were lucky a dozen or a, up, up to a hundred people at a time if they were giving a lecture or something like that. Occasionally they might have an op-ed in the, in the newspaper. Now that's, there's potential to communicate with thousands or hundreds of thousands of people on a daily basis. So the, the na nature of communication has really fundamentally shifted. And also the, the timeliness with which they need to, to communicate. So in a lot of situations nothing has changed. Um, if you're negotiating a tax treaty with uh, the Netherlands, you can take as long as you like. You know, the Australian public won't get uh, worried about that and the Dutch public won't get worried about it. But if there's a crisis that hits, uh, and an example might be the recent uh, Indian student crisis that we faced here in Australia, there's an absolute imperative to be communicating very quickly uh, and trying to minimise the damage to your national interest as quickly as possible. And I think this is an area where there needs to be a, a radical change in the way that we approach uh, communication so that we get on top of these things really quickly and nip them in the bud before they become uh, serious, um, have serious impact for the national, on the national economy. And what about monitoring of social media for, I, I know our PNG High Commission and our Fiji Commissioners have had issues um, with rumours swirling about them uh, in social media, is it, is it useful in those situations? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that Alec Ross when in his exit interviews was talking about one of the, the big changes that this has brought about is listening at state and I think that um, this is a really powerful uh, tool for diplomats to be able to pick up conversations beyond the, those that it just hears amongst its small group of face-to-face -face contacts that each diplomat happens to have. Uh, this is a real opportunity to listen in on a whole range of conversations across a whole range of areas and to really get information very uh, be, very quickly uh, rather than having to see it percolate through in tradi traditional media or through to senior um, interlocutors. So there's a lot of opportunity there I think to really monitor this in a, in a um, if not a scientific way, at least in a way that sort of captures uh, key influences and allows you to pick up on things very quickly that might impact the national interest. I don't want to explain Alec Ross and I, I might ask you, do we need an Alec Ross, do you think? Does our DFAT need an Alec Ross? Well, Alec Ross is the uh, Secretary Clinton's Senior Advisor for Innovation and he's led quite a lot of the diplomacy initiatives at state. I think it would be great if Australia had an Alec Ross equivalent. Um, it would be, a, it's a real, really sort of important, I think, to for, for such a new uh, and big change to really have somebody that's uh, out there making the case for this change and really helping um, the department move along and, and catch up with that and encouraging risk and encouraging people to, um, to to adapt the technologies and to experiment uh, because that's the way you really drive uh, good innovation and really get this technology better down uh, and make sure that you're, you, you stay with it. Any Australian ambassadors you think are particularly good? I do like Greg Moriarty. Yeah, in Indonesia, yeah, yeah. I follow him too. Now, just on your own career, Fergus, you're, you're very interesting to uh, the, our students at the ANU because you've had a really varied background. So you've uh, joined DFAT as a grad, 
Um, you've had a posting in The Hague focusing on international law. You've worked for the Lowy Institute and written a whole lot of uh, important papers about the practice of diplomacy. You've worked at Brookings, which is, you know, pretty fancy in the US, um, and you work for an NGO. So what reflections do you have about the practice of modern diplomacy, having worked in all those institutions? Uh, I, th I think that what I really like, well, what I've sort of picked up through that experience is just how important it is to bring different experiences into diplomacy. Um, I think in an age gone by, it was very common for people to have one career and to stick with that and specialise the whole way through their, their lifetime. I think one of the, the great things that I've seen in, in diplomacy is, particularly in the United States, is this sort of revolving door model where you can let people in and out of the system quite fluidly, uh, which allows you to bring in expertise from um, that you need at a particular moment in time. So you can bring in uh, Silicon Valley people and technolo technologists when you need them, and you can bring in people with commercial expe expertise when you need that. And there's this, there's this um, culture of exchange of information and a desire, I think, on behalf of also people in the private sector to want to give back to the country and spend, spend some time in the Foreign Service contributing and an appreciation within the Foreign Service itself for that external expertise coming in uh, and bringing that information. And the, the, the time that I spent at State, there was a, it was even a revolving tour without, when you weren't even talking about employees. So people with experience in, say, uh, Best Buy or different corporations in the United States would come in and give a talk just to provide information about how they're doing things in the, in the private sector that might be applicable. Uh, within the State Department. That's a thought for another day and another interview, Fergus. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming to the Thank ANU. You.